All right. I might kick off now and um, yeah, let people come in as they as they do. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Milo Kelly. Many of you would have joined us before, but we're the Agricultural Land Use Planning Team or ALLOP in um, in now Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. So there's a little change for you. Um, but we've been running this online webinar program um, paddock to planning for a couple of years now, almost two years anyway, um, where we dig into agricultural planning issues and we take a look at specific agricultural industries to give you a bit of insight when you carry out your work as planners, council staff or whatever you are, um, just as well as for your own curiosity too. So this one's in a similar vein to those ag industry webinars, but a little bit different looking at biosecurity considerations across the ag sector. Obviously, this is very topical due to a number of outbreaks in recent times. So uh, we're glad to see there's a lot of interest here today. We'll start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development acknowledges that it stands on country, which always was and always will be Aboriginal land, in my case, uh, Dharul land in the Illawarra. And we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters and show our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We're committed to providing places in which Aboriginal people are included socially, culturally and economically through thoughtful and collaborative approaches to our work. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, um, the session's being recorded, so keep your camera off and stay on mute if you don't want to be picked up and just to be polite, perhaps. Uh, we love to get any questions you've got for us or just get a discussion going, so please use the chat really vigorously. And um, we also have a survey to carry out once you, uh, before you leave, there's a link. Um, the feedback that you give us really helps it all going. So get keep this thing going and keep it tailored to your needs. The outline of today's webinar, uh, I think I say this every time, but it's a very big topic and we're not gonna get into every corner of it today. Instead, it's gonna be a bit of an intro and a chance to hear from some subject matter experts. So after I do that introduction, we're going to be hearing from Joanna uh, Blunden, our Poultry X Development Officer, uh, who will use the poultry industry as a case study of intensive animal agriculture. Uh, then we've got Nathan Cutter, our vertebrate pest experts on the risks and responsibilities of that area. And finally, Brooke Hooson, one of our state priority weed coordinators, who's going to do something similar for invasive weeds. And at the end, we're going to move into a question and answer discussion. So uh, we might run that over time if there's a bit of interest. So plug away your questions in that chat. All right, what is a biosecurity risk? We'll start with a definition. So biosecurity is a pretty broad topic and a biosecurity risk includes anything that could increase the impact of pests, diseases, weeds or contaminants in the economy, environment or the community. So obviously today um, we're going to focus on the ag sector, um, but we're going to leave contamination for another day because it's a big topic in its own right. Because of the nature of agriculture and its location in sort of in and around natural systems, this sector is one of the most impacted by biosecurity risks. Um, but we'll start with a poll. So to give you an idea of how substantial these risks are and the role everyone plays in protect, uh, protecting against them, we got this poll here. If you brought foot and mouth disease back to Australia on your shoe, say from a trip to Bali around 2022, what would be the cost to Australia's livestock industries? All right, so I think everyone gets the gist. I was trying to be a bit tricky and um, yeah, put one a little bit higher in there, but uh, as everyone's picked up, it would be quite an astronomical cost to industry. Um, and that takes us to the impacts of biosecurity risks. Um, so biosecurity risks have potential to cause massive impacts to our ag industries and ecosystems and communities. To take that example of foot and mouth disease, the impacts of an outbreak would likely include a livestock standstill, and this would extend to animals held at sale yards, depots and other transitionary areas. So that would come with really serious animal welfare concerns, among other things. 
And there'd also be the widespread economic and emotional impacts of responding, adapting for producers in their communities caused by additional workloads, stock culling, loss of export markets and other rapid shocks like this. Uh, and on top of that, $80 billion over 10 year costs um, to producers that we just cited, there'd also be the taxpayer costs of the rapid national response for the first phase of the national varroa mite response, for example, this was over $101 million, and that's for a much smaller industry. On the positive side, though, Australia is extremely lucky to have geographic protection from a lot of the world's ag biosecurity threats. And this in combination with our world-class management gives fantastic benefits like uh, having good access to premium markets, delivering better yields and decreasing costs, um, reducing stock losses and infrastructure damage from pests, and also increased food safety overall. Uh, biosecurity management in New South Wales has three broad objectives, which are to manage biosecurity risks by firstly preventing their entry, secondly finding, containing and eliminating them, and thirdly minimising their impacts through management if they can't be eliminated. And that's sort of a hierarchy of control, which I think Nathan's going to speak about a little later. But you might have noticed, for example, the shift in the national varroa mite response in the past year from elimination to management once the possibility of that had passed. So whose job is it? As anyone who's flown into an Australian airport will know, biosecurity is a shared responsibility and we all play a role in reducing that risk. And we certainly all feel the consequence when it fails. This concept's been brought through into the New South Wales Biosecurity and Food Safety Strategy from 2013 and the updated version you can see there. And it's also been formalised in law under the New South Wales Biosecurity Act 2015, which has an objective of promoting the concept of shared responsibility and uh, establishes various biosecurity duties. The general biosecurity duty, I'll let you read that definition in your own time from the Act, but it essentially states that anyone dealing with biosecurity matter has a duty to prevent, eliminate or minimise risks. Um, obviously, this puts a really high level responsibility on producers, but the planning system has a very important role to play by mitigating biosecurity impacts through both strategic and statutory processes. At a strategic level, planners can ensure that strategic plans reflect biosecurity risks present in um, particular land uses and the interactions between them, as well as uh, like landscape level threats like pests and weeds. Statutory planning decision making like DA assessment, uh, for example, are another major opportunity to avoid and minimise biosecurity risk. And luckily, there's a handy guide to help out with that. So the Managing Risks in Land Use Planning and Development Guide that we shared in one of the invites goes into detail on how biosecurity risk management applies to the New South Wales planning system and it gives guidance on how to approach assessments of different development proposals with potential biosecurity risks. We're not going to go into much of that detail today because the guide does a good job of that on its own. Um, but broadly, it contains information on things like legal responsibilities, considerations throughout different stages of the development process and potential mitigation measures for different ag land uses, as well as other things. Uh, at the end of the day, though, um, like many other matters, planners and similar staff deal with biosecurity is a specialist area. And we encourage you to reach out for advice from us at DPIRD. Uh, local land services are great too, but also peak industry bodies who put a lot of research into minimising these risks. And to that end, I'm going to hand over now to some of our DPIRD experts to speak about planning considerations for various types of risks, as well as the implications for local government more broadly. So I'll hand over now to Joe, um, who's going to be speaking about the poultry industry. Uh, thank you, Milo, and um, welcome to everybody um, who's attending today. I appreciate your interest in biosecurity. 
Um, biosecurity is obviously a huge issue uh, for the poultry industry and the um, aim of my presentation is to provide an overview of biosecurity in the poultry industry um, and how the significant impact that land use planning can have and to make um, a support industry to reduce the, the risks. So the New South Wales poultry industry has um, a couple of very distinct industry sectors. So under poultry meat, we had the uh, chicken meat industry, uh, turkeys and ducks, and the egg industry is, is including layers. Um, meat and egg consumption, um, whilst these are already significant industries in New South Wales, um, meat and egg consumption is increasing with population growth. And this means that we're getting more and larger farms in New South Wales. New South Wales is equally um, the largest chicken, meat and egg producing state uh, nationally. And so it's a very significant um, part of our food supply for Australia. And the um, geographical spread of the farms is quite different depending upon the type of farm. So if chicken meat industries, we see more in uh, clusters around the state. So depending on where you live and the regions that you're in, you may actually have these farms in your state. Whereas um, the egg industry is um, located across New South Wales um, with significant farms in the central west but um, and western districts, but also we have um, a very large farm in the Sydney Basin. So Sydney also has a significant number of, of poultry farms, which is not typical of many of our intensive uh, livestock industries, at least. Thanks, Helen. So in terms of New South Wales poultry farms, um, here's some examples of the different types of farms. So when, again, when we say poultry farm, um, we, we're talking about a huge range of different um, operations. And all of these um, have different and significant impacts in terms of um, biosecurity. And um, depending on where you live and where the poultry farms are located, um, councils might be um, have different experience um, uh, with regard to being a consent authority for these types of farms. So if we look at each of these farms um, in terms of biosecurity and what it means, and the importance of land use planning and its and its influences, uh, the scale and size of the farm is um, is very very significant. Uh, the location of the farm in relation to other uh, farms, and which includes separation distances between farms, and then the disease based risks. So, um, in this these slides in the uh, top left hand corner, obviously very large um, broiler complex. Um, we have these located in Griffith and Tamworth. Um, more the in the center on the top, more of a um, I guess a, what we call now more of a traditional sized um, broiler operation. So we often see eight to ten shed farms. Uh, on the top right hand side is actually a farm at West Wylong. It's a layer farm, and there's nearly a million birds located on that farm, and it produces nearly a third of the state's eggs. Uh, bottom left is uh, Central Coast, and that's fairly typical on the on the coast. Um, sort of farm looks a bit older, and and it looks like it's been extended or renovated. In the middle, we have our uh, small scale free range operation, which are all over the state, um, including um, you know coastal strip, but also out out in western areas. And then um, I guess the the Sydney Basin, where we have um, one farm co-located in and amongst all other farms. And typically, I guess we, you know, we can identify what the amenity impacts of these types of things might be, but you can also understand that the biosecurity impacts um, and risks of these farms are all quite different and need to be considered on the merit of the individual farm, but also in relation to the, um, the neighbours and the risks that are posed by the operations um, around them. Thanks, Helen. So why is in poultry... Why is biosecurity important to the poultry production? Um, it's all about preventing the introduction of disease agents onto poultry farms, um, preventing the spread of disease agents from infected areas to uninfected areas, and to minimise the incidence and the spread of um, these microorganisms um, that are in of public health significance. And I guess in terms of thinking about this, to give you an example at the moment, um, very much you, if you think about um, avian influenza, um, in terms of preventing the infectious disease coming onto farm, um, that has to do with, in part, uh, location of farms in proximity to um, areas where particularly wild um, fowl habitat, a wildfowl habitat, um, 
preventing disease agents from infected area to uninfected area. We currently have control zones in place, et cetera, but obviously proximity of farms to other farms is very is very significant with regard to that, and that includes um, very small-scale farms and backyard operations. And then minimising the spread um, into um, the, the public is very much about on-farm biosecurity and, again, co-location of farms, all of which you can see have um, land use planning has an impact on all of these considerations and, um, and why biosecurity remains important for our industries. Thanks, Helen. There are many biosecurity um, guidelines that are uh, available. Um, if you are assessing a development application. And these are around um, both the technical best practice on a farm, so what a farm should be doing, but certainly with regard to planning and development, as I said, one of the biggest, in terms of a hierarchy, the biggest influence on the uh, biosecurity risk of a farm is actually um, its site location. So where that site is first located, but also um, proximity of other farms uh, that it may be established or enterprises that may be established after the farm is there. And so in, when looking at and considering um, land use planning, and um, there are many biosecurity guidelines available. So we have here best practice for chicken meat um, guidelines. We have environmental guidelines for the, um, the egg industry, and we have national biosecurity guidelines that include um, things such as water sanitation and other things that you would expect to see in a DA. Again, as Milo said at the start, um, certainly we encourage industry to reference all of these in their um, development applications, but for councils that are less familiar, um, DPI is, is, is very happy to provide assistance in assessing the technical aspects and technical merit of um, any of the applications that you get, and particularly with regard to biosecurity. Thanks, Helen. So what are the major transmission pathways on, of disease on poultry farms, and how are these um, important for um, biosecurity and land use planning? So disease first transmission is from poultry to poultry or um, bird, you know, bird to poultry. Um, other animals can also bring disease um, into and off poultry farms. So things such as rodents. Um, people are one of our biggest spreaders as well as equipment and vehicles. So that movement between farms, poultry industries are extremely um, what we call integrated industries, which means that there is a lot of um interaction between each and many of the farms and that has uh, great benefits in terms of efficiency but also brings inherent biosecurity risks and therefore we have uh, biosecurity established at at gates and and other things in terms of washing vehicles um feed is another way that we actually see um biosecurity risks introduced onto farm uh, water, but also um, things can spread in aerosols, so via air. So all of these things have um, components in terms of land use planning considerations and how farms are established and operated. Thanks, Helen. So separation distances is one of the biggest um, issues with regard to biosecurity um, for poultry farms. So Poultry farms, production farms, we suggest um, a minimum separation distance of 1,000 square metres between farm. Again, that, that stops or reduces risks such as, in the previous slide as we saw, things such as animals or rodents um, and aerosol uh, separate, um, transmission, but also just in terms of separation distances between farms, it increases the um, the the ability of a farm manager to maintain their own biosecurity within the perimeter of their, their farm. Uh, duck farms and wetlands should be separated um, by 3,000 metres. And again, that's just an indication of the risk that those things breed, bring. And breeder farm separation from other farms should be, uh, we recommend 5,000 metres. And that has to do with the high value of the stock on those farms. If we lose or we get a disease incursion on a breeder farm, then um, those birds are the future of the next generation within the poultry sector and can therefore have a big um, impact on the, the supply going forward. Those separation distances are um, listed in those biosecurity guidelines for industry and industry is very aware um, of these. And so it both comes into consideration for site selection and planning of a new farm, but also if we're actually looking at if there's a farm established and somebody else is looking to set up nearby, we should be considering um, that separation distance. Thanks, Milo. 
So biosecurity in land use planning. Why is it important? What are the risks? Well, basically, why is it important? Um, it, the land use planning system is a is the the safeguard, I suppose, to ensure that farms are uh, set up in in locations that in, um, reduce the risk of other other farms. And um, it also means that surrounding land uses that have a potential to impact upon the management and productivity, but also the animal welfare of an existing farm. So if we have a farm established um, near another farm and it increases the um, biosecurity risk, the, the prospect of a disease introduction, we actually get um, a, a heightened risk in terms of disease transmission. So the ways that these risks can be mitigated are through strategic plans of the council and what's permissible in various areas, uh, local environment plans, but also very much in terms of the um, determining of new DAs. So that's in terms of uh, new farm uh, developments and proposed developments near um, poultry farms. But what are the risks if this doesn't happen? Well, first of all, there's land use conflict. So sometimes we see that even with regard to um, spreading of litter on nearby or manure, poultry manure on may not be a poultry farm, but next door to an existing poultry farm that introduces biosecurity risks. It might be about uh, storage facilities that are located near poultry facilities and what those what those storage facilities contain. It might be around things such as um, you know, poor rodent control or vermin control on a property that then impacts on the poultry farm and their ability to maintain their biosecurity. We've talked about disease transmission pathways and how the closer poultry farms are located to other um, poultry species um, and the, the, the greater risk of, of um, disease transmission. There's a risk for the farms um, that they will have difficulty mitigating their risk and operating their farms um, and implementing their biosecurity plans if those um, activities outside the boundary impact on them. Thanks, Helen. However, having said all of this and the fact that we have um, many, many um, guides to assessors and industry is really cognizant um, of the actual risks that apply. There's, there is definitely increasing um, complexity in the biosecurity space. And this has to do with um, urban and peri-urban development. Um, that is, so if we use the Sydney Basin as an example, um, that more people around means potentially more uh, poultry species co-located. Uh, Peri-urban development office sees people uh, undertaking practices such as spreading poultry litter, maintaining small flocks of poultry, which can increase the, um, the, the risk to the farms that are already there. There's also the industry structural change that is occurring. So we are seeing um, more uh, free range production systems and the more birds we have outside, the more likely they are to interact with other bird species and in increase the um, the risk of uh, disease transmission onto the farm. We're also seeing uh, small scale and micro farms that are being um, developed, which means, again, um, some of these people are less aware that they potentially need a DA. Perhaps their site selection isn't what we would um, normally see with a larger farm, it might already just be, it might be opportunistic. They may already own a piece of land and decide that they wish to undertake um, small scale farming. But on the other side of things, we're also seeing more farm, what we call complexes, very large farms. And the more birds that we have grouped in one area um, is, is more likely that disease transmission will occur within the farm if it's introduced. Um, farm change of use, as industry structural change occurs, we're seeing the actual change of use of farms um, being undertaken. So you may have a farm that is a broiler farm that wishes to convert to a layer farm. Um, uh, and as different farms have different risk profiles, and that then means that we have um, different species being co-located or different farm styles being co-located, which increases the risk of biosecurity. We've also seen recent uh, planning framework changes that potentially increase the risk um, of biosecurity in, um, to biosecurity and that things such as agritourism um, that, that is permissible, um, maybe permissible near a, an existing poultry farm, um, whether it's people um, who are unaware that are doing things on an adjoining or nearby property or whether or not it's, um, you know, people bringing 
animals into those circumstances that would increase the risk to the existing farm. And also the changing climate. Um, we're actually seeing different vectors in different locations, um, whether it's, it's um, you know, changes to wild bird flight pathways, whether or not it's to do with the ability of organisms to survive in environments. All of these things are actually seeing us getting different um, diseases in different areas and the livability of those or survivability of those diseases um, is becoming different. So the, the complexity in terms of um, biosecurity management for farms is, is changing, but also um, I guess for planners and um, and the land use planning discipline, um, it, it is getting more more complicated as we see the the profile of industry, the poultry industry change. Thanks, Helen. Um, I just thought I'd raise a couple of examples to give you an idea of the types of things that we that we see um, with with industry. So this is actually a, a map of a recent uh, DA that was submitted. And the yellow line um, on this represents a road and those grey um, rectangular sections are the proposed sheds. The, the issue that we had or DPI has with this, so we wouldn't consider this um, good, um, the site itself was a good site selection, but the siting of the farm, we didn't, all the, all the sheds wasn't considered to be appropriate. Um, because of the proximity of the sheds to the road. So like everything, the farm can only control what is within its boundary. So the road itself, um, potentially vehicles driving up and down that road, feather and dander and other things can um, enter the property boundary, which then reduces the, the farm's ability to maintain their biosecurity. Similarly, um, the activities that are undertaken on the road, um, you know, whether it's people throwing rubbish or anything else, um, the, the location of those sheds really close to the road um, certainly is not ideal and reduces the farm's ability to maintain their own biosecurity within their perimeter. So the greater the distance of the sheds from the boundary, um, the greater the ability of the farm to uh, control their biosecurity. And I guess that fits with also, you know, odour control and other such things. But um, certainly that that doesn't fit our recommendation of an appropriate siting um, for a facility. Thanks, Helen. This is an example. Um, this is actually a, an ad for, for sale um, on the Central Coast, but you can see here in terms of biosecurity, this particular farm um, has very limited ability um, to maintain its own biosecurity in terms of what might come over the fence. So that farm can have um, has you know a good setback from the road, but its co-location uh, very close in proximity to um, other poultry farms is a significant issue. The farm next door also appears to have been um, you know extended at some at some time, um, which is again a, com a complex issue for um, council planners because um, that's a way that farms maintain their viability is to increase in scale. However, trying to weigh up whether or not th that increased scale actually creates a greater biosecurity risk or not is one of the, I suppose, the issues and the complexities in terms of um, analysis. You can see, though, that there would be both in what we call endemic um, biosecurity risks, so just day-to-day -day diseases, et cetera, but if we had an exotic disease outbreak on one of those farms, the other farms nearby would be also put under um, very, very restricted conditions. Um, that would mean it's very difficult operating environment and very costly um, for those farms that are co-located. So ideally, whilst we have many of these, these um, farms that are co-located, that certainly isn't an ideal example. Thanks, Helen. So biosecurity um, in terms of considerations when visiting a farm, and I thought that I would raise um, this with you because when you, as a council officer, so whether this is a land use planning uh, visit or any visit by, by council, um, there are biosecurity obligations when uh, visiting a poultry farm. So the there are legislative um, obligations. There's also industry best practice um, that, that applies. So in terms of minimising biosecurity risks, you have a shared responsibility when attending the farm. Every time you enter a poultry pro property, 
um, there's a potential to spread pests and disease, and also, I guess, weeds, um, in deference to my other colleagues who will uh, be speaking in a moment. Um, minimising these risks is a shared responsibility between you and the land manager. And as a visitor, um, you should make yourself aware of the potential risks that you pose to that farm or farms that you're going to visit after you've been onto a poultry farm or an ag farm. And there, so there are steps that you can undertake um, to make proactive efforts to reduce those risks. Many pro properties will have their own biosecurity plan. So before entering the farm, um, you should check with the manager about the biosecurity management plan that they have in place and what you need to do to compl comply with that plan. Um, at the moment, New South Wales poultry farms are under a biosecurity control order, which actually means that, as I said, as a visitor, you have a legal obligation to be aware of your responsibilities when entering that farm. Um, farm managers are best placed to provide you with that information, but by entering that farm, you are required to abide by those requirements. So in terms of biosecurity management plans, um, keep an eye out for um, signs such as, you know, visitor signs um, that will be on the gate. Typically on the gate, there will actually be um, a phone number to ring. Don't enter the farm without uh, speaking to the, the farm manager um, or without prior approval. And this includes um, vehicles and, and people um, that, you, that may be looking to enter the farm. We also suggest uh, reducing unnecessary access. So whether that's just about, um, you know, minimising the number of vehicles that go onto a farm, uh, whether it's minimising the number of people, whether it's actually about thinking whether or not you can actually do that work or visit by another, another means. Um, similarly, in terms of limiting access, only go to areas that are listed as parking areas. Don't go beyond those areas with a vehicle. Um, don't go wandering around the farm looking for somebody. As I said, ensure that it's pre-arranged and that um, you have contacted someone. Ideally, meet at the gate. Um, and also in terms of come clean, go clean, it's about ensuring that you and any of the equipment that you're carrying um, doesn't actually have any pests and um, disease associated with your visit. So this includes like where have you been um, prior to, where has your vehicle been? Typically farms will require you, poultry farms will require you to um, any, any vehicle that is entering a production area will need to be decontaminated on and off the farm, which, as I said, is a good reason not to take your vehicle on if you don't need to. You will be required to wear PPE whilst on the farm. Um, farms will typically provide this to you. However, again, you should check with the poultry farm with regard to what they um, will require you to do. If you don't need to go into the production area, um, which may include range areas, sheds or grading floors um, with an egg farm, um, don't. Um, you can often sort of get the information you need without going inside those facilities. You'll also typically be asked to sign um, the biosecurity visitor declaration form. Um, it's too small for you to read there. Most farms will have one of these forms and basically it says that you agree to abide by the conditions of the farm and it includes things such as um, having not been to a poultry premise um, or a butcher shop uh, rendering facility within the last 72 hours and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that you don't have any poultry or pigs at home. So it's really important when council staff are looking to head out to farm that they are aware of these types of protocols that industry has in place. And at different times, such as at the moment, um, farms with the um, avian influenza outbreak, farms will even extend that 72 hours for a longer period or may actually say, unless this is a legal requirement, we don't want anybody on our farm. And it's just about limiting that risk of, of spread. Um, and look, they might ask that you change your shoes um, at, or wear um gum boots provided by the farm, or as I said, that you'll wear full disposable overalls, et cetera, but follow the direction of the of the farm that you're visiting is the, um, the best advice that um, I can give you with regard to um, visiting poultry farms. Thanks, Helen.
And that's me. Very good. Thanks very much, Joe. There's some really good practical advice there. So please put any questions you got for Joe into the chat and we'll get to them at the end. And just as we hand over to Nathan, we've got another quick poll to pop up. Uh, approximately how much does pest and weed management cost agricultural producers in Australia each year? This comes from some federal um, uh, ag department research. Very good. So once again, people have got the right idea. It is in the billions, um, just even at contemporary estimates and imaginably that would grow over time. Um, so Nathan, take it away. Yeah. Um, thanks, Milo. Just um, getting my uh, screen to work again. Um, so if we could just go back to the first slide, Helen, please. Thank you. So my presentation covers non-native pest animal management in New South Wales, why pest animals are a concern and what we can do collectively to assist in preventing these pests impacting on our communities, on the environment and economy. I'm going to briefly cover the full spectrum of issues from already widespread pests we're familiar with uh, to incursions of new uh, pest species we haven't uh, seen before in the state. Next slide, please. So if you're not familiar with this graph, it's uh, a model invasion curve for invasive species. So it indicates that the economic returns are greatest at the prevention and eradication stages of the invasion. So that's that circled area of the graph. And that's why it's so important to be aware of new incursion risks as well as engaging in appropriate surveillance, management and compliance activities. So our goals in New South Wales, which are outlined in the New South Wales Invasive Species Plan, are to efficiently and effectively manage the biosecurity risks of pest animals. Firstly, by preventing their entry into New South Wales, we often do this with the Commonwealth in collaboration with the Commonwealth at the border. And secondly, if we do have incursions, promptly reporting, finding, containing and eradicating them, which is what we're doing um, with the avian influenza um, virus that uh, we're currently responding to. And that way we avoid a situation where eradication of a new pest is no longer viable with our currently available tools that we have on hand. And so then we move into an asset management response phase, which is to the right of that graph. Next slide, please. So on mainland Australia, uh, we've had at least 73 non-native vertebrate pests establish wild populations. So that includes mammals, birds, reptiles, and freshwater fish species. The cane toad is our major amphibian uh, pest, but other notable widespread pests include the pig, deer, fox, and rabbit, which I'm sure most of you would be familiar with. Since European settlement in Australia, 45 native species extinctions have been attributed to invasive species. Additionally, established non-native pests are estimated to cause more than a billion dollars of damage per year to Australian agriculture through disease transmission, predation, and competition for resources. However, there are many other less common native, non-native animals which could, um, could cause biosecurity and biodiversity impacts in, uh, in our state and Australia-wide. Next slide, please. In fact, Australia faces a new wave of pest animal incursions, and the animals featured on this page are just a selection of the incursions we've intercepted in New South Wales. I see pest animal incursion reports as the tip of an iceberg for biosecurity and biodiversity. Firstly, because by the time a new invasive species is recognised, it can have been there for a while, imposing a range of negative impacts. As an example, Red imported fire ant, which I've got a map of on the um, left-hand side top of this uh, screen, was first detected in Queensland in 2001, but is thought to have been in that state for 20 years prior to be, be being detected. And it's continued to spread throughout southeast Queensland. To, and this is the current uh, spread in pink 
um, of fire ant in southeast Queensland. And a recent review of the eradication program estimated that we might need to spend 200 to 300 million dollars a year to achieve eradication by 2032. What's of particular concern to New South Wales is that the fire ant infested area in Queensland is continuing to spread and is now only kilometres from the New South Wales border. And you may see a small patch of green there. That's, um, that's the incursion area. Um, that's uh, been caused due to uh, an infestation in Corumban Creek. And during 2023 and 2024, fire ant nests were actually detected in Lismore and Ballina. But because they were quickly found, we were able to destroy them and, um, and continue to monitoring, monitor them. So it's a great case study to illustrate the value of early detection and treatment. But ongoing work is now required in these areas to ensure eradication has been achieved. And this requires a full commitment from the entire community. So also of concern is the risk of exotic animal disease like avian influenza, which we um, just heard about. And um, as an example of uh, an incursion recently that we, uh, we had in New South Wales, on the left-hand side, you'll see um, some raccoons uh, pictured. These arrived on a cargo ship and quickly disembarked um, in, and got into trees in Port Botany. And this was a real biosecurity concern for a number of reasons, but principally because this species is, is very aggressive and a vector for rabies, which is an exotic animal disease I'm sure you've heard of, but is not currently present in Australia. So EADs or exotic animal diseases like rabies, avian influenza, foot and mouth disease, which we've all heard of, earlier in the presentation, are able to be carried by exotic animals like parrots, hedgehogs and raccoons. So we need to work collectively to be aware of the risks and the potential pathways of these animals so that any unusual animal sightings are reported and managed promptly. Next slide, please. The cane toad's another example of what I call an iceberg species. But with cane toads, we're focused on preventing the species spreading in New South Wales because it's already considered to be established in the Northern Rivers area above the Clarence River. Um, we have still 98% of the state, uh, which is cane toad free. And that's due to the work of communities and public land managers in, um, in reporting and managing uh, cane toad incursions because they're a notorious stowaway. They come in on all sorts of vehicles and freight and, um, and goods. So we need to be quite aware of uh, the pathways and the presence of this animal because there's no broad scale control mechanism for cane toads. So being aware and managing them effectively and quickly um, is really important. So this map um, actually confirms uh, where cane toads have been reported in New South Wales. And the red and amber parts of the map indicate the extent of the cane toad biosecurity zone, um, which we established in 2019 to help slow the spread and further establishment of cane toads. But new satellite cane toad populations do pop up. And in 2022 and 23, we've spent um, quite a considerable amount of time, collaboration with uh, LGAs, Landcare, uh, LLS and DPIRD um, in eradicating a new cane toad population on the central coast where we've been able to remove 53 toads from an area called Mandalong. Next slide, please. So when uh, DPIRD receives a report of an unusual non-native animal, Either it could be either captured or illegally kept, it could be advertised for sale or spotted in the open environment. We undertake an, uh, an investigation. Um, we follow up with the reporter and record all the intelligence that we're provided. Uh, we inform other stakeholders, and that includes the LGAs, LLS, National Parks and Wildlife, and other public land managers, as well, well as potential private land managers in the area. Um, and in some cases, we need to prepare mapping and uh, SIP rep reports for those stakeholders. Um, our 
ultimate aim is to collect that animal and have it um, screen for any biosecurity uh, concerns that it may have. So all of our animals um, are risk assessed and quite a few of them do go to our, um, to our vet uh, diagnostics lab at Camden, which is a biosecurity facility. And we also uh, work with the Australian Museum to um, make sure that samples are collected for uh, genetics, uh, uh, genetic um, profiling um, and building a genetic uh, biobank. Um, in some cases, what happens is that we need to progress through um, through prosecution um, if, if it is an illegal keeping matter. But generally, we um, are trying to reduce the biosecurity and biodiversity implications of these new incursions. Next slide, please. So to get a better understanding of priority non-native pest animals across the state, each uh, of the 11 local land service regions in New South Wales have prepared a regional strategic pest animal management plan like the one you see on the left hand side. Um, this plan is for the Hunter region, but it, as you'll notice, it's uh, slightly out of date. All of the regional plans have been uh, reviewed and about to be republished for the next five year period. And they basically outline all of the priority pests as well as alert species like cane toads, for example, um, which the community needs to be aware of. Um, and um, so for that particular region, it's been highlighted as a particular pathway risk. Um, so I'd encourage you to download um, the new regional plans from the LLS website uh, when they're out, which will be shortly. Next slide, please. I'd also encourage you to look up the BioResponse New South Wales app, uh, which is a free app, and it provides uh, users of the, of the app with up-to-date information on biosecurity emergencies. So we currently have information on that app for the avian influenza response, the red imported fire ant, and the white spot, uh, white spot syndrome virus for prawns. So you can download um, this app from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store um, and put it on your phone and be updated with all of those obligations and um, current update, updated situation reports on those responses and any uh, biosecurity um, and emergency responses uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So how can you help? Um, what I'd like you to do is consider in your jobs and social circles just um, ways that you can increase industry, public and visitor awareness. So visitors to a, um, a region are particularly um, particularly able to um, do things that they're not aware of that might implicate, might impose biosecurity um, risks. And um, earlier you saw some of our um, promotional material. We have a lot of promotional material for download from our website. Um, and signs and so forth that can be put up in your LGA to, to um, raise awareness around non-native animals and the risks of their, um, their uh, presence and spread. So we'd like you to help educate landholders and members of the community that you're um, on how to report unusual sightings. Um, and even if it's um, even if it's just hearsay or uh, a rumor, we can um, work with that that information, uh, and it might corroborate other information that we've received earlier. Um, lastly, if you have an event that's coming up that you'd like DPIRD to um, to visit, we do have um, the ability a small team uh, that can attend uh, um, events to raise awareness. And next slide. Lastly, I'd like you to, um, yeah, just the next slide, please, Helen. Thank you. Lastly, I'd uh, like you to report any unusual animal uh, uh, sightings or information related to illegal keeping or trade in unusual animals. Any information um, that you have can help prevent the incursion or establishment of new pest animal species. And as I said, we've got a range of 
brochures and posters which are available from for download from the site um, that's got the URL there. You can browse and you can print those uh, posters and so forth for your community, for your homes and workplaces. And next slide. That's uh, that's it. Thanks very much for uh, for listening to my Thank presentation. You, Nathan. I never would have thought hedgehogs or raccoons would have been an issue here, but I that's guess right. Things can change it's, fast. Mm, it's not common knowledge, and that's why I really appreciate you inviting us to talk about that. Thank you, Myla. Fantastic. So, any questions for Joe and Nathan? Please put them in the chat. It looks like we'll be rolling over to get to them, but that's quite all right. You'll be able to catch them at the very least answered in the recording or we'll follow up with an email with any unanswered ones. So we'll hand over now to Brooke, who's going to be discussing her role as a weeds coordinator. Thanks, Milo. And thanks, everyone, for being here and your interest in attendance today. Uh, they're obviously pretty, pretty important topics, especially to us. My name is Brooke. Oh, no. Nope. Back to the first slide. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. My name is Brooke and I'm one of seven uh, State Party Weed Coordinators working for DPIRD. Uh, the fact that there are so many of us really does reflect the fact that there are not many places in the state where you can go where you won't see weeds. So I'm going to run through some of the basics of weed biosecurity and the risks weeds can pose to New South Wales. Next slide. Thanks, Helen. So why do weeds deserve our attention? Uh, the direct costs, oh, sorry, the cost of the ag sector alone uh, is around $1.8 billion per year, uh, either in direct control costs or in costs associated with lost yield. If you have a look at the images I've got here showing some of the other negative effects weeds can have as well. So these images on the outside, so on the left there, we've got tropical soda apple and kidney leaf mud plantain on the right. So tropical soda apple was having some pretty devastating effects in the north of the state uh, where cattle are spreading it rapidly and it's overtaking good grazing land and infesting several forestry plantations uh, up where I am. This kidney leaf on the right here was found in a drainage line running alongside a busy road where it's completely blocked water flow. So aquatic weeds can be devastating for the local environment. They can displace native species, reduce light, food and shelter for fish and other aquatic animals, and they can prevent uh, boating, fishing, swimming, and most of your recreational activities as well. They can block irrigation channels, uh, which can be major and can be dangerous by hiding the water level along the um, sort of by hiding the water surface so it looks like firm ground. This photo in the centre shows you some of the potential negative health effects that weeds can pose. So this was a pretty severe reaction to parthenium weed, which is one of the many species that can cause allergies and respiratory problems for humans and animals. In Queensland, this weed is affecting over 60 million hectares of land and costing upwards of 69 million a year in lost beef production. Um, and it has made its way down into New South Wales along the major highways and via contaminated fodder, machinery and chicken feed coming down from Queensland. So in, in addition to these, these things you can see here, weeds can also harbour pests and diseases. They can increase bushfire intensity. They can restrict access for animals to water and shade, lower the value of the land. They, they are causing pretty severe mental health issues with landowners who you know can't get on top of weed problems on their land. And they can threaten natural and cultural heritage sites. Next slide, please, Helen. So it's because of these adverse impacts on the economy, environment and community that they are described as biosecurity risks. The world of weed biosecurity involves preventing new weeds from entering, eradicating and containing new weeds before they spread and minimising the impacts of weeds that cannot be eradicated or contained. And I've just thrown a photo in there to show you an example of tropical soda apple. Um, completely taking over the understory of a forestry, a native forestry plantation on the north coast. Next slide, please. So in New South Wales, all biosecurity risks, including weeds, are legislated under the New South Wales Biosecurity Act 2015, which Milo touched on earlier. So the Biosecurity Act is administered by the Department of Primary Industries, but it's implemented and enforced by your local control authorities, LCAs which are your local councils, county councils, and joint organisations. 
The Act is underpinned by the principle that every person and organisation has a role to play in biosecurity, and so it applies equally to all people and all land in the state. It is a shared responsibility. It also provides regulatory tools that might be applied to any land in the state with regards to weeds. So for example, individual biosecurity directions or a biosecurity undertaking. These tools can be issued to a person that may have contravened a requirement of the Biosecurity Act and will outline biosecurity measures in place to manage the risks associated with the weed on a property. These regulatory tools are in place all over the state. Uh, there may be some currently active in your local council areas, and I'd strongly recommend investigating this when assessing any new or existing development applications. Next slide, please. Weeds are regulated under the Biosecurity Act according to the risk they present. Uh, so some weeds pose a high risk to the entire state of New South Wales. These are called state priority weeds. Specific legal requirements apply to state priority weeds. So there are weed species that must be kept out of New South Wales and they are listed in the Act as prohibitive matter. It is an offence to deal with or possess prohibitive matter and anyone who finds them has a duty to notify their LCA or DPI or LLS immediately and a duty to eliminate the risks associated with that plant. There are currently 28 weeds that are prohibitive matter, for example, frogbit, parthenium weed, and the one I've got in the middle of the screen here is myconia, and it's also behind my head here. There are some weeds that must be eradicated from New South Wales, and there are control orders in place for these weeds. Tropical soda apple is an example of a control order weed, which is on the top screen here and was in the previous slide. Biosecurity zones um, are weeds that must be contained to the core infestation area, and there are also mandatory measures in place in New South Wales, uh, for example, that prohibit the sale or import of certain weed species. There is also a mandatory measure that restricts the import of equipment and machinery from Queensland that may be contaminated with parthenium weed seed. As public land managers, councils really need to be aware of these duties and able to accurately identify and manage all state priority weeds within their area of operation according to the legislated requirements. Thanks, Helen. I've thrown in an example here uh, where a state priority weed is having a major influence on the use of the land and any development or movement um, on that land. In the lead up to 2020, shipments of organic chicken feed were brought down from Queensland and distributed at rural supply stores all over the state. It was found during 2020 that these batches were contaminated with parthenium weed seed uh, and infestations were starting to pop up on various land use sites. So some of these were backyard farmers with a handful of chooks. There was one organic vegetable farm, which is the photo in the middle there with, um, oh, sorry, on the left with us doing the rapid response. And there was also um, one large commercial chicken farm on the north coast that was affected by these infestations. So these infestations triggered multiple rapid responses to eradicate the plants that were found and conduct surveillance of the surrounding area and ensure it hadn't spread. All movement from the properties had to be monitored and clean down procedures followed. Unfortunately, one of the properties, which is the one here, did lose its organic status due to the fact that herbicides needed to be used to eradicate this weed. It has a really long seed viability. Uh, so this is an example of where biosecurity undertakings were issued by the local control authority and the landholders had to implement mandatory measures to manage the risk associated with parthenium weed. Many of these properties will have ongoing monthly monitoring for years to come and would be the sorts of properties where biosecurity planning really is important if they were to submit any development applications for assessment. Next slide, please. So most weeds you see in your local area are not state priority weeds, thankfully, um, with specific legislated requirements. Most weeds are covered by the general biosecurity duty. So the General biosecurity duty puts an obligation on all people to be aware of the impacts their commercial, professional, volunteer, recreational or lifestyle practices might have on their economy, environment and community and to take action uh, to prevent those impacts. The general biosecurity duty can apply to any plant in any situation where it is causing or has the potential to cause a negative impact on the environment, economy or community. Thanks, Helen.
To help guide these priorities, outcomes and recommended managed for land measures, sorry, for land managers, <clears throat> we have these documents, the regional strategic weed management plans. So these plans were developed by regional weed committees for each of the 11 local land services regions last year uh, and are intended to guide weed management programs by containing a full list of all state and regional priority weeds for each region and outlining duties and responsibilities attached to those species. You can find these plans online on the local land services website or get in touch with your local control authority weed officer or local land services regional weed coordinator. Thanks, Helen. So who is responsible for enforcing compliance with the requirements for state and regional priority weeds and for assessing whether the general biosecurity applies to other weeds beside their priorities? So local government actually has that responsibility. Local government have had the legal responsibility of implementing and enforcing weed management for over 100 years because across a state as large as New South Wales, there's great variation in the types of weed species found and in the ability of those weeds to impact on local flora, fauna, production and amenity. It's recognised that councils are best placed to, uh, to make or inform decisions about weed management priorities in their local areas. Thanks, Helen. Local control authorities uh, have responsibility for these five functions uh, relating to weeds under Section 371 of the Act. So they, I'll just let you read through those um, in your own time, I think, rather than running through them all. Next slide, thanks, Helen. The staff appointed by the local control authority as authorised officers under the Act or your point of call for all things relating to weeds. I'd recommend finding out who your local control authority is and contacting your local authorised officer to find out if land you're assessing already has a state party weed or to organise for an inspection to be undertaken to see what's there. This will ensure that you've taken responsibility for any legislation controls and mandatory measures that may be required to be undertaken on that land and to become aware of any major risks that might be present, such as parthenium weed or frog bit in a neighbouring drainage line. Your local weeds officer might also be able to provide weed identification books, uh, group education and training sessions on how to identify any high-risk species in your area and, of course, what to do if you do find something suspicious. There are also lots of other resources and support available outside of your uh, local control authority uh, with us here at DPIRD. As the lead agency for weeds biosecurity in New South Wales, we are available to advise LCAs on how to implement and improve weed management programs and to provide funding through the Weeds Action Program. We also develop and deliver training courses to support staff working for councils in weed identification, community engagement, weed risk assessment, hygiene practices, um, also safe chemical use and operating of machinery and vehicles. These resources all shown here are available and there is a link to the New South Wales Weedwise app, uh, which I highly recommend everyone to have on their phones. So this will help you identify weeds on your land and check out what the biosecurity duty might be for those species and any control or reporting options um, as well. There is also the weeds mailbox email there, which you can send anything, anything you would like through for. Thanks, Helen. So that wraps it up for me today. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you for listening, and I hope you've learned something new yeah. about the importance of what we do in the weed space. Thanks, Marlo. Thanks so much, Brooke. Um, that was very informative, and we're very notorious here for trying to squeeze as much as we can out of an hour. So thanks for people hanging on over. We'll get into a few questions that have come through uh, from the chat. We might just start. <coughs> um, with Joe, there was a question around the requirements for visiting and clarification on whether that line about um, butchers meant a, a butcher's shop or something more particular. And just a quick reminder as Joe gets ready to respond, um, if you're on your way out, please consider filling out our survey um, for the for the session. Helen's posted a link to that in the chat. It really helps us out. So Joe, go for it. Molly, could I just ask you to repeat that one? Sorry, I had my yeah, sorry. My so turned down pretty the, 
the question was around um, the biosecurity restrictions that come up in, um, you know, the waiver around butcher's shops. Does that mean a conventional butcher shop? And what other considerations maybe might be common? Mm, so mostly it's around if you've been to another, um, you know, pig or poultry farm. I said um, conventional butcher shop, yes, and um, rendering facilities. And I guess the reason that we mention those is because some council compliance officers will actually attend a variety of, um, of business types and it's just being aware about scheduling um, and, and it will also depend on um, whether or not, again, you need to enter the production area. So it doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely can't go. It's about explaining and and um, being transparent about where you have been in the last, you know, 72 hours, and then you and the farm will be able to negotiate the level of risk that that poses in terms of biosecurity and um, if you can go onto the farm and where you can go onto the farm. So good. Um, and now there was a question for Nathan that he's partly answered around um, <laughs> using pest animals for, for leather, but is there anything you'd like to elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I was just answering the second part of the question then. So um, the question was around, is there anything preventing um, the use of pest animals in um, for uh, production of leather? And um, my answer would be no. Um, pest animals aren't protected in any way. However, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development have developed um, best practice codes of practice, which I've I've um, linked into the chat here. Um, really, um, it's around efficient. Uh, so these are all re well-researched um, procedures. So efficient, effective, and above all, humane methods of uh, control. And um, no, there's no um, no restriction really generally that I can think of that would prevent you um, using those pelts then. So for example, feral pigs and um, and deer and so forth, you, you can actually harvest those. There are chiller boxes available, um, you know, for consumption of um, of wild game meat. However, you know, like it, it, uh, the, the restrictions are only around ensuring um, that, the, that the product is uh, suitable for human consumption. A lot of, uh, um, we're only talking about non-native pest animals but in the native uh native uh area you know even kangaroos are harvested under a national parks and wildlife scheme uh where they're overpopulated uh and and that's often used for for the uh for, for human consumption and pet consumption so there's a range of uses commercial uses but probably the only what I, what i was trying to um emphasize, I suppose, is for efficiency, um, a lot of these industries are probably better um, served by commercial farms, which which New South Wales is able, as, as we saw in our first presentation, we're able to farm a lot of these useful commercial animals. But no, nothing really restricting the harvesting of pest animals for, for, um, for use in leather operations and so forth just efficiency and, and ensuring that the means that are used are humane. I hope that answers the question, good. Genevieve. Definitely. Um, well, it will give her a start at the very least, but that's great. Um, there was a great point from Mel Wilkerson, maybe from LLS, so correct me if I'm wrong there, Mel, can give a wave if yes, um, who was he saying is. when you're looking at yeah development, um, uh, development applications and assessing those for things like roads, infrastructure, or really anything that comes through, it's worthwhile looking at the source material locations when they come from outside council areas, um, just in case there's any real hot spots or, or real mm. kind of, um, mm. uh, I, I suppose, boundaries, you know, yeah. of invasive if, species to if, be concerned yeah, about. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to just talk about that. And, and, you know, relation to, we know the pathways for parthenium weed. We know that they come in on the harvesting material and so forth, harvesting equipment. But a perfect case case uh, study is when I talked about our incursion sites for 
fire ant in New South Wales. Now, we've got a restriction now on where those nests have been detected and treated because we have to work for years now ensuring that those nests are no longer, um, no longer um, viable. So we have to continue to, uh, to test uh, those areas. And now those areas are potentially locked up for movement of materials off. So it, it, is, it is a potential risk to any developers in those, uh, those areas. They have to work under um, biosecurity, um, I suppose, conditions to ensure that we're not, we're not inadvertently spreading fire ant. So it, it is a real implication, and that's why I say um, perhaps download that bioresponse app and be aware of where we have responses, where there might be control orders on equipment coming and going, materials coming and going, and just to be aware, uh, for councils to be aware of um, the implications of, say, a development that might inadvertently spread something. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's a good thing to look out for when you're reviewing things like biosecurity and weed management plans, for example. Um, we had another question, this was for Joe, um, about storage facilities as a biosecurity risk. Um, would you be able to elaborate on what kind of storage facilities you're talking about? So, Mike, it can be things such as um, facilities like that that would store like landscape supplies, which could include litter and those sorts of things. So it's anything that it could include poultry or or pig material and those types of things. Um, and also in in terms of industrial areas or any neighbors and and control of vermin and and that's probably another one. Um, but yeah, the the activities that go on um, next door or adjacent to nearby um, poultry facilities can have an impact on the ability of that facility to maintain their biosecurity. Simple as that. Well, any last minute chances to grab a question? Otherwise, we might leave it there. And uh, big thank you to our presenters here. As always, this is, um, you know, a, a real opportunity to show who's working in this space. Um, I think everyone here will, is definitely open to be reached out to for any questions you have um, either following up or for any future developments or other things you might be looking at. As with us too, we're always happy to coordinate that and um, we'll compile those kind of um, a resource list as well as a contact list sometime after the event along with the recording. So you can look forward to that. Thank you very much everyone for attending and we hope to see you at the next one.